So, uh, welcome to seminar number six, um, which is mostly about RPD, NDM, and two, actually three events um, related to um, the U.S. Navy, uh, which, are the, which is the stimulus for much of this work. Um, before we begin, any questions from last time? The video is unfortunately has has as a result of human error. <laughs> so we will have to make a new version of the video. The uh, the events that we're talking about are closely linked together, and although they're often presented separately they should all be treated together because the behaviors that you see in them cannot, don't, won't make sense to you unless um, you understand the relationship in time between these four activities or four events. The first event was um, the um, near sinking of the USS Stark. So the USS Stark was a uh, uh, a frigate. Um, it was a ship that was um, designed to um, provide both a, uh, some offensive power and some coordination power. Uh, and it, it is a, um, a sort of an intermediate sized ship that has the ability to launch missiles. And, and modern naval warfare is mostly about missiles. The days of big guns firing a, a, essentially a, you know, an explosive shell some distance, these are all over now because those guns at the maximum could fire a distance of 16 to 18 miles, so something like 20 to 25 kilometers. And that was the practical limit. Even if you made the gun bigger and longer, you couldn't get much further than that. And so um, as soon as people had the ability to make rockets and missiles that were self-propelled, where the, the, instead of trying to throw a big weight, you actually launch something that had its own energy source and carried it along. This completely changed the battlefield. And um, the oceans were no longer measured in distances that you could see over. They were measured in distances that were much larger, like 100 miles or so. The problem with this is that nobody can see for 100 miles. The curvature of the Earth makes it impossible to see much beyond 15 miles, even under the best conditions. And um, so the, the way in which warfare is conducted in the, in the latter half of the 20th century at sea is now completely different than it was from the time about up till about 1960. There's just no comparison. All the really big ships, the great battleships, are retired. No one has anything like this anymore because they're not useful. And instead, you have these ships which are intermediate sized, which are, are basically missile launching platforms. They have the ability to launch missiles that can attack either aircraft or, or sea targets. And the missiles are usually stored underneath the decks. You don't see them very much, which is why the ship looks kind of uninteresting. But on, uh, in certain conditions, the missiles can be brought up and launched and, and guided towards their target. The real importance of this is, uh, is partly the ability to launch those missiles, but also the ability to detect things. And so these have, uh, uh, these have um, among other things, very advanced radar, which is extremely good at detecting and, and keeping track of various targets. And because they have these two combinations of, of things, the, uh, some US ships were tasked in the, um, uh, in, the in 1987 to accompany oil transport vessels so that they could defend these oil transport vessels against um, uh, attacks while they were in the Straits of Hormuz. Um, the nature of the, of the map is such that um, there's lots of oil and all of the oil has to come out to a very small area of water and then essentially be shipped down a very tight little place past an area called the Straits of Hormuz. To get all the way out into the Gulf uh, and, and be essentially uh, uh, able to be moved elsewhere. 
This is a, these are called littoral waters in Navy terms. And they're quite different than the kind of place that the, the Stark and other ships were designed for. The Stark and the other ships like this were designed to fight a, essentially a world war against the Russians. This was going to be fought at sea by great forces shooting over large areas of open ocean with large task forces with aircraft carriers and everything moving together. It was all going to be out in the open ocean. And the big problem was going to be finding the other guy and shooting him down. And the assumption was pretty much that the only thing you're going to have to do during the war is shoot down anything that's a certain distance away and seems to be headed in your direction. Because when you're at war, all the peacetime operations disappear. No one really thought very much about other kinds of conflicts that, that people could be involved in. And, and it, it was unclear um, how exactly we should uh, deal with other kinds of problems. But you remember that in this time period, Iran and Iraq were engaged in a great war. Because the Iran-Iraq war was basically a war of trench warfare, like it was in the First World War, with lots of soldiers and lots of artillery and mass killings of them. And it was hundreds of thousands. And, and they died in what was essentially a, a, a kind of a draw. And the US was, um, as, as it sometimes uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to tell whose side it was on. It was really on the, the U.S. was really on the side of oil. I mean, if you were going to say what did, what, what did the U.S. like, it liked oil. And the reason it liked oil is because oil is the only reason anybody would pay any attention to this part of the world. If they didn't have oil, they could fight to everyone's heart's content. No one would be involved. But the fact that they have all this oil makes them really important because we live in a world that depends upon oil. And everything that has happened since about 1918 in that part of the world has been related to oil. Okay? The US, therefore, has a huge interest in making sure that no matter who wins this battle, oil continues to flow out to this world. Because if the oil doesn't flow, then the oil price of oil goes way up, and it becomes really hard to fuel your Cadillac or your your Mercedes Benz or whatever and drive it for long distances in order to be able to park at a shopping mall. So given that this is so important, and, and it's not because the US used the oil, the US does not use the oil. The oil is used primarily by Europe and Japan and other countries, but the market for oil is a worldwide market. So if you take some away that was originally going to Japan or, or Europe, Everybody else is going to bid for the other oil, which is now from the US, and it will drive the prices up. And no one wants to see the price of oil go up, except for a few people in Texas. So the US had some interest in making sure that while the war was going on, these countries are fighting with each other, and Iran and Iraq share a big border, so it was a land war, um, that, that, at the, that the continued flow of oil from the oil fields out into the Gulf was uninterrupted. And so the President of the United States, in his, in his inestimable wisdom, assigned US naval forces to escort big tankers, oil tankers, as they were going through here as a way of essentially fending off any kinds of attacks that might occur on them. And the idea was that you might attack a big super tanker, but you're unlikely to attack a US frigate, because if you do attack a US frigate, you're surely going to die. I mean, this, it's a completely one-sided battle. If you attack a US frigate, you will be killed. Whereas if you attack a big super tanker, you might actually get on board and be able to take it over and blow it up or other things like this. So the idea was that they were going to have US Navy ships accompany these, these tankers as they were going out of the Gulf. Actually, no one cared as they were coming in. They were empty then. You could kill, you could destroy those. But the ones loaded with oil, they were going to accompany them. Um, <coughs> The, both sides um, wanted to control the flow of oil, and so there were a whole bunch of mines placed uh, in, in the Gulf, minefields placed, and the minefields were there to try and make it impossible to move the tankers, and so the US had both the ability to, to sweep some of the mines and also to uh, accompany the big tankers. The, the Stark was traveling uh, in one area 
in, in the Gulf, uh, not right at the Straits of Hormuz, and <coughs> it was now in a situation which is unusual for a, for a commander of a big ship. Remember that I said that the commanders of these vessels had imagined that they were going to be in a war in which anything coming at them from a certain distance was sure to be enemy and therefore should be killed. So you, all, you didn't have to see who it was or what it was doing. If it was headed at you at any kind of rate of speed, you just assumed that it was the enemy, you shut it down because there were nothing out there except the Russians and the Americans fighting this great World War III. This wasn't like that. This was a different situation, and, and it was different in two big ways. One, it was literal, and, and that meant that there wasn't a huge span of ocean over which you could maneuver. It was actually fairly cramped in there for these big ships. They, had, they didn't have a lot of room to maneuver. They couldn't go a lot of places. They, had to kind, they were kind of stuck there. And, and there's lots of hazards to navigation and stuff. And the second reason that it was problematic is that there were lots of things that would show up in your radar that were not enemy planes. In fact, most of the planes in the air were not enemy planes. Most of them are civilian planes. They're flying from here to there, this and that, so on and so forth, just like everything. World, the life is going on while the war is going on. And, and the problem now becomes that the captains of these ships are stuck in this little space and they have to run around and keep people from banging onto the oil uh, tankers. And they have to do this by shooting down aircraft that might be attacking them and so on and so forth. But they have to be, get it right. They have to distinguish between things that are problems, like somebody coming at them to try and sink either the US frigate or the oil tanker, and ordinary aircraft, which most of the time is not too hard to do. Most of the time, if you are flying a military aircraft, you're on a mission, you're going to fly either very, very high or very, very low. You fly very, very high if you're going to go a long distance. You fly very, very low if you're going to go a short distance. And the reason you fly low is because you don't want to be detected by radar. And the closer you get to the surface of the water, the harder it is for the radar to see you. So a plane that's descending particularly below the usual commercial flight levels of 10 or 12,000 feet, you know, 3,000 meters, 12,000 uh, 3,000 to 4,000 meters. The plane that's descending looks like it's getting ready to do something wrong. And if it's not descending towards an airport to land, this suggests that it might be an attacker. On the other hand, a plane that's flying in level flight, just kind of moseying along at 300 knots or so, that's probably a civilian. Now, to help deal with this, both of uh, the aircraft in the air have in them, now, now made famous by the, by the Malaysian air flight, a thing called a transponder. Mm -hmm. And the transponder is a thing that gets pinged by a radar set on the ground, and it says, who are you? And what comes back from the transponder is a code that says, I am um, flight 370, um, let's see, I might wait flight, I'll call myself Iranian Air Flight 370. And that's what comes back. And so this sort of process sort of lights it up on the screen and you see the little dot, and then right next to it it says IA370. That's how you know what it is, because the transponder is doing it. There are multiple versions of these transponders, multiple frequencies that they can operate on. There's type 1, type 2, type 3, a very variety of complex things. But in any event, the, the idea is that it is possible to separate out the commercial traffic from the military traffic and decide whether or not something's attacking. The Stark uh, was on the ocean and flying in its direction was a, an airplane, an Air, Air, Air Force plane, uh, uh, from um, the Iraqi Air Force. And the plane flying from the, this is an Iraqi. That's during the time of uh, Saddam, mother of all battles, Hussein. And it's flying towards the Stark. And the Stark picks it up on its radar. The radar comes back. and. Inside the command center, which I showed you a picture of in some of the handouts, there are all these consoles with all these displays. 
there's people looking at these displays and they see this thing coming at them and they say, ah, what is that? And the captain of the Stark said, ah, that is a, a commercial airliner. And the plane kept coming towards them and he kept saying it was a commercial airliner. Now the U.S. was not at war with anyone at this time. There was no battle going on. The U.S. wasn't launching or upper offensive operations. It was pretty relatively quiet. There had been some problems in the Gulf, but again, it was Iran and Iraq that were fighting, and the U.S. did not care so long as the oil kept flowing. So what happened, of course, is that outside of uh, the, the, the immediate uh, range, this, this plane dropped a thing, a missile called an Exocet. Exocet is made by a French company. It's a very fast missile. It travels at well over two times the speed of sound. It's basically a rocket with a big warhead attached to it. And it, did, it launched not one, but two Exocet missiles. And the, the two Exocets were targeted at the Stark, and they immediately did what they were programmed to do, which is to go very, very low and very fast. So they are very close down by the water. They drop very quickly and they get way down by the water. And the reason that they do that is because the ships on board computers will see the waves on the surface returning echoes and it'll be confusing. They'll be lost in that. If you can get close enough to the water, it's like you're on the water and then nobody will see you. And the captain, up until the very last moment, did not realize that he was under attack. And the two exocets came in. The first one came in and actually whacked this area right here. It did not explode. It did spill all of its fuel all over and start a big fire. And then the second one came in and it did explode and it tore a big hole in the side of the Stark and caused a big problem. By the way, the Stark was made mostly out of aluminum. And it turns out that if you get aluminum hot enough, it will burn. So it turned that they actually got it, the whole thing going. It's really a big thing and killed a lot of sailors really damaged the Stark, if you see some of the pictures of that. What's interesting about this is that, uh, from, a, from a Navy standpoint, is that the, the, the sailors did a great job of keeping the ship afloat. Other ships would have sunk. They're very good at damage control. They limped back to port. They were able to get themselves pulled back by a tug. The ship was essentially saved, and so on and so forth. But knocked him down a rank and forced him to retire uh, from the Navy, which is a huge disgrace. The reason they did this is because the first and primary goal of the captain is to keep his ship from being sunk or grounded. There are two things that you should never do. One is you should never let anybody shoot at you and cause a, a big hole that will sink your ship. And the other thing you should do is never run aground. Don't run onto anything. Don't get on the rocks. Whatever you do, stay off the rocks and don't let anybody sink your ship. And basically, he let someone attack his ship without doing anything in response. There's a lot of dispute about what happened to the Iraqi pilot. He immediately turned around, went back. Uh, there's, there's stories that were the, the, the Iraqi pilot was uh, later executed. There are stories that he is now living a happy life someplace in, in uh, 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 suburban Baghdad in a very nice villa. I mean, there's a lot, nobody knows where the guy is. But the story at the time was that the, the pilot here had thought that he was attacking an Iranian oil tanker. That is, the story is that the pilot of this plane did not think he was attacking a US warship. He thought he was attacking an Iranian oil tanker. Now, whether or not you think this is plausible, I don't know. But the point is that you have to do these things from so far away that it's really hard to see things and identify them by eye. You're depending mostly on instruments. This was a big disaster in a whole bunch of different ways for the US. It was a public relations disaster. It was terrible for the Navy because they had been basically shot down by a French missile. And, and they had suffered this terrible defeat at the hands of a, of a sort of secondary power. And it wasn't supposed to play out this way. A year later, called the Samuel B. Roberts, is going through the Straits of Hormuz and runs into a mine. The reason mines are so bad is because they explode below the water. It's not like an explosion above. The water contains the damage and focuses it inward. And because mines can be very, very large, they can weigh thousands of pounds because you don't have to launch them or fire them at anyone. They can be really big and very destructive. 
the mine was, was almost certainly an Iranian mine. Four days later, the U.S. launched an attack, destroyed a couple of large Iraqi oil platforms in the Gulf that were being used to launch uh, attacks on shipping. At the same time, along with that, they sank or destroyed about half of the Iranian Navy. I mean, they basically just zapped them. This brings us to 3 July. A couple of months later, long enough for many of the crews that did this to be gone, USS Vincennes uh, is in the Gulf, and it's doing its routine, along with a couple of other sister, sister ships, a ship called the Sides. And the USS Vincennes is the very latest, greatest kind of shipping that's going on. It has a thing called an Aegis radars, radar system. Aegis is uh, a shield, li literally a mythical shield. And Aegis is a radar sh system that looks out over a great distance and keeps track of everything that's going on and is very, very clever. It keeps, can keep track of their guys and our guys and who's fighting who and what's going where for a lot of space. It's a really an advanced thing. And the reason, the way you can tell this is when you look at the ship, it, it looks like a kind of an ordinary ship like this. But when you look at the front, at, at the stuff that's up on top, there's almost nothing there. There's a mast and some radars and stuff. But there's almost nothing there. But then you look at the sides of this, and you see something that looks sort of like a big octagon on the surface of this. And there'll be one on, on the front, and one on the sides, and one on the back. There's this big octagon. And those are radar antenna that are part of this Aegis system. That's how you can tell an Aegis ship if you see it. And the guys, this, this connects to a control center that is the mother of all control centers. I mean, this is just a, an incredibly good control center. It's got everything in it. It's dark. It's, it's window. It doesn't have any windows. It's nicely air conditioned. It's very carefully laid out. Lots of display screens and all this sort of stuff. And these guys can watch whatever's going on. They are watching whatever goes on. And a couple of things happen. Uh, one is that some Iranians with suicidal views of life have taken a bunch of little speedboats with rocket-propelled grenade launchers and uh, small machine guns. And they're out patrolling the Gulf. Now. <clears throat> You know, these guys are no threat to anybody, but they're nasty and they're pesky. And at one point, there's the, the U.S. sends out a helicopter, the, the, the Vincent sends out a helicopter uh, from its back deck to go look at these guys and chase them away and so on. And basically, there's, there's this kind of little beginnings of an interaction. Not a big one, not a terrible, terribly important one. However, the captain of the Vincennes, um, <clears throat> is very disappointed because he missed praying mantis. And he has been very, he's, he's really wanted to keep things going. He's got a very gung-ho attitude. He's very, very interested in propelling all this stuff forward and making things happen. And so he is considered to be kind of a gung-ho guy. In fact, something of a, we, we would call it a cowboy meaning that it's a person who is likely to act before thinking through things very clearly. So these ships turn around and they start to go away from him because they have the helicopter and so on and so forth. They recognize that there are no, there are no uh, competition for a US naval force. They're heading away. The Vincennes is out here someplace. And they, these guys have turned to go away. And at the same time, the Vincennes starts chasing them. That is, rather than just wait for them to go away, the Vincennes cranks up, you know, 30 knots. That's nautical miles per hour. That's pretty good speed. That's like 50 k, you know. And they're zooming after these guys. These guys have already entered into the Iranian territorial waters. They're, in, they're not in, in international waters anymore. They're zooming this way. These guys are following them at a high rate of speed. And, some people are going, well, why are you doing that? What's the purpose of that? What, what are you going to do? What's, the, what's actually going to happen? And um, it, it turns out that the Iranians do fire a couple of shots this way. But actually, it turns out that the US probably fired first. It's a little unclear, you know, fog of war, all that sort of stuff. 
But in any event, this was a very substantial activity by the sides and the Vincennes. They're heading in as fast as they can in this direction. At the same time, roughly about the same time, an Iranian aircraft, an Airbus uh, 300, lifts off from Baghdad. It's on its way to, uh, I'm sorry, lifts off from Tehran on its way to someplace else in the Gulf, Dubai maybe? But it's a short hop, so they're not going to go way up to 35,000. They're not going to go up to 10,000 meters and come down there. It's a short skirt, so they're only going to go up to about 4,000 meters and then come down. And they are headed sort of in the direction of these guys. And because of the way that these guys are looking at the world, they can see them. They see this jet plane coming at them at an altitude sort of uncertain. And they're pinging it, saying, who are you, with their transponder stuff. But they're transponding on a particular frequency that doesn't include the one that this aircraft is supposed to have. This aircraft has got a transponder on it that is broadcasting out, I am uh, uranium, uh, uh, uranium, uranium air uh, XXX. It says that to anybody who will ask, but the problem is that the US ship is not asking. It's asking on a different frequency. And the US ship gets, gets a little concerned because this thing sort of seems to be on a course in here. And they've just had an encounter with these guys on these speedboats, really scary guys. And they said, maybe this is part of a coordinated attack. So they get on the military frequency and they call out to this supposed plane out here and they say, you know, you are invading, uh, you're headed towards an American warship, turn around and go back. Well. This is, again, a commercial airline. It's not listening to any of the military frequencies. So it never gets that message. The guy is, you know, he's happy. He's having, you know, some pita and hummus or whatever he's doing. But, he, you know, the captain is not terribly excited about this. This is a routine commercial flight. He has no idea that something's going wrong. And <clears throat> he keeps coming closer and closer. Now, actually, the thing that's interesting is that while the Airbus is coming closer and closer, um, its altitude is actually increasing. It's still on the up part. It's getting up into the air. It's kind of going to go like this and then come down where it lands. It's up. It's rising, which is a very unusual signature for somebody who's going to do an attack. If you're going to attack one of these ships, you get down on the ground as low as you can, come in as fast as you can, launch your missiles, turn around and get its way as, as fast as you can. This guy's loping along at 300 knots up high, you know, just kind of like out for a Sunday drive. And it's hard to make this into a, an attack. But the guys on the Vincennes, the captain on the Vincennes, is convinced that this is an attacking airline, attacking uh, uh, aircraft. He believes it's an F-14. He believes it's coming at him. Iran had F-14s because, as you may recall, the US and Iran were at one time allies. And then the US sold Iran lots and lots of military hardware, which is now being used against it um, at this time. At some point, the captain here says, we're going to shoot down that aircraft if it doesn't respond. And everybody in the command center decides that they're under attack. Not everybody, apparently. Some people do not decide this. Interestingly enough, the captain of the sides, who is an experienced naval officer and has been in the Gulf for a long time, says, this is not an attack. This is not it. You're, you're, you've locked onto this plane. You're going to shoot it down. This is not an attack. Don't, uh, but he doesn't actually say that in so many words. What he does is he thinks it, but it's, he's the captain. And actually, he's supposed to be under the Vincennes. That is, the Vincennes is giving the directions, and he is supposed to be doing what they are saying. That's the role that the sides has. So he doesn't like it. And even some, maybe some people inside the Vincennes don't think it's a good idea. But the, sh the plane gets closer, and the captain launches uh, a couple of missiles. And the missiles uh, go up and do what they are supposed to do, which is to destroy their target. And they do. They tear the wings off the plane. And it falls to the ground. Kills 300 plus people, something like 300 people. 60 children on their way to some sort of school activity or something like this, vacation. But they, you know, it's, it's just a really bad situation. This is the worst thing you can possibly do. The captain of the sides, at the time that this occurs, is, says, my God, he shot down a Comair, meaning a commercial aircraft. 
So he immediately understands what has happened. These guys learn about it very quickly afterward. They recognize they have actually shot down a commercial airliner in its ordinary flight space doing its ordinary thing. Now this is a real problem. When, when you have, if, you have, if you think you have a public relations problem when one of your ships strikes a mine, shoot down a commercial airliner with a whole bunch of Iranian children on it, see what kind of, what kind of a reaction it gets. No one is happy with this, absolutely no one. And the, one of the nice things about the event is that this Aegis thing is essentially a huge tape recorder. I mean, it records everything. It records all the tracks. It records all the orders. It records everything. So they've got an almost perfect record of everything that's going on. And in fact, when they play it back, they can see that the plane is rising, not descending. And they can tell that they're not calling on the right transponder frequency, and they're using only the military frequencies. And this is a scheduled flight at the right time, but there's a half an hour time difference between the clocks in these different places so that it doesn't look like it's in the right place. And you've had this little bit of a fracas here, but again, very small, so that people are on this kind of war footing. And anyhow, it's after praying mantis. We're really gunned up against the Iranians. We're feeling like we have to. And so it ends up with a shot down airliner. Big problem. Everybody says this is a big problem. Interestingly enough, unlike the captain of the Stark, the captain of the Vincennes finishes his tour of duty, goes home, and gets a medal. He does not get cashiered. He does not face a court martial. He goes home and gets a medal. In fact, everybody on the ship gets a medal. For what? For being good Navy people and doing their mission. For, for essentially completing their mission. Which in this particular case, given what happened to the Stark, is don't let anybody sink your ship. If you think somebody's going to sink your ship, kill them before they kill you. And, and the reasoning in this is, is, is genuine. The closer the plane gets, the harder it is going to be to defend yourself against it. And once it launches the missiles, they're traveling so fast that it's going to be really, really hard for you to stop them. So you have to basically kill them before they shoot at you, or very near that moment. So it really is a dicey kind of proposition. It's not straightforward. But, the, but the, remember that just about a year earlier, almost exactly a year earlier, this guy had let somebody get too close and shot him out of the water and blew it up. And he said, and that guy, that guy got cashiered. He got, this guy is not going to have that happen. You get close to his ship, he's going to shoot you down especially if he's been calling and saying things and transponding and all this sort of stuff. Well, how does this happen? The answer is nobody really knows because one of the things that happens when you have this biggest screw up is that everybody starts lying. And the Iranians lie, the Americans lie, um, the Iraqis apparently lie, um, and probably some Israelis lie in there someplace, but everybody's lying. Nobody's telling the truth. Nobody's being open about this. There are lots of... Uh, uh, investigations. There's a formal investigation by the Navy and by the, 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 but all of this stuff gets censored and modified, and you know, it's it's nobody's going to actually admit that anything went wrong. In fact, it takes several years afterwards for it to become clear that the plane was rising, that it was not part of a coordinated attack, that it was not, for instance, a, a, an Airbus with an F-14 right behind it that was tracking along in its in its shadow so that it could drop down and shoot at the American wasn't anything like that. This is a plain old ordinary fuck up. Okay, This is as bad as it gets if you are an American naval commander, but even worse if you happen to be on board this Iranian Airbus 300, because all those people died. This was a very big event, and no one, uh, uh, even though no one has got the complete story and got the captures it all uh, right, the sequence of events is not lost on the people in the military. And they are they are really confronted with a problem. If you are an admiral in the US Navy, you've got this problem. On one hand, you don't shoot when you should have. And on the other hand, you do shoot when you shouldn't have. And these things are happening just about a year apart. In the same setting, at the same time, it's kind of the same situation. So you're confronted with this problem. You've got all this fancy technology. You've got all these devices that are supposed to help you conduct a war. And you can't, you, you're sometimes shooting down the wrong person and not shooting down the right one. 
And part of it is because this is a very pressurized place. The fact that everybody is close together means that things have to be decided very quickly. There's no time to sort out what's going on. It's not like you're a thousand miles away and you see them coming. This is a, this is a place where things happen very quickly because everything's close together. And because there is no longer this kind of World War III scenario where you have the Russians and the Americans shooting at each other, but rather you've got the Iranians and the Iraqis shooting at each other, and you standing off on the side trying to kind of keep things from getting near the oil tankers, it's a different mission. It's a completely different mission. Something for which none of the technology was de designed. The technology was designed to shoot down just about everything out there. So the Navy began some work on trying to understand what was going on here. And this led to a couple of very interesting developments, which for our purposes are extremely useful. And, and the, the, what's, what's useful about them is that if you have a situation where you do the opposite things in two different situations, and they're both wrong, you really have a problem on your hands. If if, you, if you're going along and you just fail to shoot down things that you're supposed to shoot down, that's all that happens over and over and over again, you say, ah, our sensitivity threshold is set way too low. We need to become much more sensitive to what's going on so that when we see one of these things, we shoot it down. On the other hand, if you are constantly shooting down unarmed aircraft, you know, you're, <laughs> things that are non-combatants and you're destroying them, if you're doing that, you say, well, gee, our sensitivity is way too low. We need to raise it. We, actually, I'm saying it backwards. We need to make ourselves get our sensitivity levels adjusted so that we are not triggering on a hair trigger all the time. These are, these are the wrong things to shoot at. But that's not what's happening. What's happening here is you have a situation where you have a combination of things that is not a clear sensitivity problem. Instead, you have a situation where you shoot at and destroy something, you fail in one way here, and then you shoot and don't shoot at and destroy something up here in a different sort of setting. It, it's, it's not straightforward. You can't fix this just by adjusting the radars to be more or less sensitive. It's a real problem. I mean, it's a genuine problem. You, you, want, to, you want to be able to discriminate between things that are attackers and things that aren't, but you're not doing that reliably. And it's clear from this that the Navy understands that they have to start understanding something about how people make decisions. There really, there really is no substitute for understanding the captain and the commanding officers in the CIC and what their mental processes are. You have to know about this because these are the guys who somehow decided to do both of these things. And you know, admittedly there are differences between the cases, but still you've got this big problem, which is how do people do this? And so this generates, this becomes a kind of a, a three-mile island for the Navy. Three-mile island for the Navy. Um, and <coughs> they, uh, they try to steer their ship a little bit in the direction of doing some decision research. And there are two kinds of things that seem to come out of this, which are the two topics that we are interested in. Um, one is RPD, and the other is NDM. RPD is, was developed by Gary Klein, um, and really given its substance by Gary Klein. And RPD stands for Recognition Primed decision making. And RPD is a really big departure from the way in which decision making has been studied up till now. Let's go back and look at that history. People have tried to figure out how folks make decisions for a very long time, but the modern study of decision making is, is heavily influenced by a guy named De Groot. And De Groot was a chess player, 
and he studied chess games. And de Groot's chess game studies were pretty interesting because he found some features of experts that were different from the features of novices. What he did is, is he, he watched what people were doing and tried to figure out what the reasons for doing them were. But he ended up uh, spawning some research that had, had some quite interesting results. Later on, a guy named Simon, remember Simon, Nobel Prize winner? Simon and Chase together did some experiments, and they found some interesting things. If you show an expert a chessboard with some chess pieces on it, and then ask him from memory to reconstruct the chessboard, he can do that pretty well. Experts are actually quite, quite good at remembering patterns that they see in chess games and being able to copy those patterns down later. If you can show them the chessboard, even for a very short period of time, just a few seconds, and they're able to remember and then place the pieces on a chessboard in the same way. What's interesting about this is not that they have such good memories, but that their good memories are somehow conditioned on on actually what can really happen. So if you have chess positions that you get in a game, in a real game, a setting that, that could actually happen, this happens, it's a real uh, position that you can get to, the memory quality is really good. Whereas if you just have a random placement of the pieces on the board. You just take pieces and you put them on the board. You put them in any old order, just randomly. Not the kind of thing that's the result of a game, but just pieces. Their memory for the position is much worse. And this is a pretty important finding. Because it means that what people are doing is not somehow photographing with their eyes the world and then reconstructing what they have a photograph of. But they are seeing in this some sets of relationships or meaningful patterns that they then can call back and reproduce. There's some intermediate stage. It's not like a camera. It's not, it's not uh, you know, a camera taking a picture. Okay? It's not this. What it is, is it's coming up with a memory for this pattern out of a stock of what must be many, many sets of such memories, and saying, this is the one that I'm seeing here, so that later on he can go back and do this reconstruction. And, and that's true, because if you give them the, the random patterns, they cannot do it so well. So when you ask them to do what is the equivalent of taking a picture and remembering that and then reconstructing it, they're much worse at it. They're better than novices. They're better than people who don't play chess. But they're much worse at this than they are looking at the place at the things that you can actually get in a real game. The better the expert, the, the better they are at doing this task. And that's an incredibly important observation. Because what it says is that skill at chess, the ability to be, or, or we'll call it expertise in this case, that expertise at chess has a lot to do with some kind of memory structure that is present in the person who's looking at the pattern that allows them to match what they see with a piece of memory that's already there in order to be able to recreate that thing later. That is, what it says is that, the, that, that there's a process going on here that somehow recognizes it recognizes, not this, it recognizes this pattern. It goes through this memories thing and looks at these things and comes up and says, ah, this is a thus. We don't have any trouble with this. We recognize we do this all the time. Our best rec recognition is our recognition for faces. It's built into us probably as a survival mechanism. So children can tell very early on when people are smiling or not smiling. They can recognize mom as opposed to someone else. They know the difference between a stranger and someone they've seen before. These are probably survival traits. You probably needed this to get along, you know, long back when there were 
when there's woolly mammoths around. But the, but the point is that this is going on all the time. And rather than simply looking at something and making a picture of it, we're doing something active with the world. This active process is looking through our store of patterns and, and uh, uh, images and saying, what is this like? And in the particular case of chess, De Groot showed, and De Groot did this, you know, this is from the 1960s, right? This is a long, this is, this is dark ages in cognitive terms, because in the 1960s, everybody's a behaviorist. So from the 1960s to the, until the 1990s, everybody's in this behavioral stimulus response thing. This guy's asking, making inferences about what's happening in the heads of people. No, you don't believe any of that. So he's kind of out, way off in left field. Nobody pays any attention to him until Simon and Chase come along later on, about, about 25 years later or so, and they start doing these experiments, and they come up with this, this particular pattern. Now, that isn't all that chess players do. Chess players, once they have this pattern, then they have to do some sort of decision. They have to decide what to move and how. Okay, that's a, probably a different problem. That is, just remembering the position is not the same thing as making the next move. But clearly, if you have a big structure of these in your head, and you remember not only this at, the, at move one, but things that you got from move two and move three, and so on and so forth, if you have remember sequences like this, it means that picking out the right way to proceed is pretty easy. And in fact, chess players do this all the time. They have openings that are named for specific chess players that are given these names, both an attack and a defense that have names, and they're because they're from classic games. And what do chess players do when they're trying to become skilled at chess is they study old games. So somehow this process is, is going on, but it's critically de dependent on this recognition thing. It's very interesting. I had a friend who was a, who was a, a, a grandmaster, and when I would travel, with him in the car, his son and I were friends. When we would travel in the car, we would sit in the back seat with a chessboard on our laps, each of us. And we would call out moves to him, and he would tell us what moves to make back without looking in two games simultaneously. And he had no problem, and he beat us all the time. <laughs> so he, it, what, what, you, what you get from this is that expertise relies not just on your ability to decide, but on, on uh, your ability to recognize what's going on. Most of the decision research here that was going on was based upon some sort of Bayesian kind of concept of the world. And, and whether or not the Bayesian approach is, is good or not, it depends a lot on calculations. That is, you have to calculate the probability versus the value of different kinds of outcomes. And then comparing them, you can decide which one is the best choice, and you make that best choice. What's interesting here, though, is these guys didn't seem to be doing anything like that. They're not calculating anything. They're just remembering what some things look like. And they can go on to win chess matches on that basis. So they can make decisions, but the decisions are not made so much by doing a calculation of a bunch of different things as by being experienced and prepared to respond to the situation that they face recognizing it, and then going on from there. And so Klein comes up with this idea about recognition primed. That is, you, you put it in there at the beginning. You prime it, like you prime a wall with, with primer paint, or you prime uh, uh, a, a, an explosive charge with a detonator. Priming of the decision making, that there's two stages, that there is this recognition thing that tells you what kind of situation you're facing. And then there's this process that tells you how to go about dealing with such a situation. Klein uses this kind of idea to start a whole set of studies in which he looks specifically at this problem. He goes and he looks right directly at the problem of the Combat Information Center, or CIC, of an Aegis missile cruiser. And he, he goes right in there. He go, I mean, it's hard to imagine because Gary Klein is the quietest, meekest, smallest, least military person you will ever meet in your life. And here he goes right into the CIC with these guys to watch what they're doing. And you can just, I, I, there are no pictures of him there, but I can just imagine in my mind, he's, he's a little kind of nice looking guy, a little goatee, you know, 
very glasses, you know, just completely non-military. And he's watching these guys do all these things in this combat information center, which is ready to launch missiles and all this sort of stuff, and making little notes and, and talking to them about what they're doing. He actually does this. He talks to these guys about what they're doing. And he comes up with a couple of interesting things. And, and one is that um, nobody seems uh, to calculate. Nobody's calculating or uh, nobody's doing any kind of calculation or any computation that he can detect that looks like any kind of evaluation of different alternatives based upon their likelihood or outcome. So this utility theory, the Bayesian stuff, and, and by the way, people have been trying to get humans to do this for a long time. They want you to be Bayesian. The fact that you do not seem to be Bayesian is obviously a mistake. You're doing things the wrong way because this is clearly the best way. But he doesn't find that. He doesn't see anybody doing anything like that. He's got to drop that fairly quickly. These guys, are whatever they're doing, they're not doing Bayesian calculation. The other thing is that, that they, they are not they're not looking for uh, the one best way. They don't seem to contrast and compare lots of alternatives. Instead, what they do is they seem to take from experience what it seems that deals with the problem that they face. That is, they take their recognition, and based upon that, they look at a very limited number of alternatives until they find something that seems to get them where they want to be, and they simply do it. They don't futz around. They don't, they don't hem and haw. They don't get out calculators. They, they look at the situation. They say, we're going to do this. And the place that uh, Klein discovers this most clearly is on fire ground commanders, that is, the guys who are standing outside the burning building and directing people to do things to try and control the fire or, or get out of the fire. And, and he recognizes that they're not calculating. And they're not, they don't look for the best solution. They look for a solution that will work in the situation that they're faced with. Later on, Rasmussen, oops, will look at nurses and physicians working in an intensive care unit and conclude that rather than making decisions in a Bayesian sort of way, they seem very much to be launching activities and then keeping track of things to see if things are playing out the way they expected. That is, they're not so much trying to do a whole new, new uh, decision each time as they are saying they're getting something started and they go back to check to see if things are progressing in the way that they expected. And if not, then they have to re-update themselves. But Rasmussen, remember, he said it all. It was a little later than Klein, but he still said it. Um, the consequences of this are, are disturbing because for people who believe that there's lots and lots of choices, this seems to be, you know, by uh, absolute dead winners in all the economic theories and all the rest of this stuff. Bayesian calculation seems to be number one, and if you're not doing it, somehow you must be failing. And, and Klein, to his credit, does not say, uh, this is the way people should do it. He's saying, look, when I study people working in the real world with hard problems, this is what they do. And he points out that they do this in part because there's time pressure. And later, people go on to identify some other features of this imperfect information. and an evolving situation. That is, it's not the case that the Bayesian guys have, where you know everything about the world, you put it all into some big computer, it computes the best choice of action. In fact, what you do is you go into a situation where you have to decide things pretty quickly, or you're going to lose the opportunity to do so. But the information that you're getting is not always true or complete or accurate. In fact, lots of it is missing or inaccurate. It's hard to tell. And finally, it isn't going to stay the same. The situation can change. It can, it can become more or less threatening. Things can change in there. So that you can't simply decide and turn around and walk away. You can't walk in the fire commander and say, you guys do this, you guys do that, and say, oh, fine, I'm getting in my car and going home. You have to stay there to continue to inv be involved with this. And so naturalistic decision making 
MDM takes on this collection of stuff and sort of turns it into an understanding. It's not a science. It's not even really a theory. What it is is it's a set of empirical observations about how people do things in the real world. And given that they do these things, trying to explain why that might be a reasonable thing to do. If you connect this stuff up together, you begin to get a sense of ways in which things could misfire. Okay, And one of the things would be, if your expertise is not well calibrated for the position, the situation that you're confronted with. So if, for instance, you take chess experts and you give them non-chess problems, they do about as good as average people do. Right? They're, not, they're not geniuses at solving problems. They're geniuses at chess. So one of the key factors is, is the expertise that you have suitable to the problem that you face? And you all know this to be true. You can be an expert at something and have another problem of another kind next door. And you know, you look at this and you go, wow, that, I don't know what that is. I don't know what to do. So although there may be some benefit in general problem solving skills, and people talk about developing what they call problem isomorphs, that is a basic problem that you solve. And, and once you've done that, you can apply that to many different situations. That probably has very little to do with real expertise. Teaching people problem solving strategies is probably not a very good thing in and of itself. Now, the opposite of this is giving people lots of experience with actual problems in their real world probably does help. That's clearly what chess people are doing when they're reading through these games and, and studying the moves. But to say, I'm going to teach you how to assemble the list of alternatives and to do differential diagnosis by getting rid of all these things. Is, is probably not all that useful. House on TV is very good on TV. House is not so good in the real world. Okay, It's a nice idea. And it fits with many people's, interestingly enough, it fits with many people's own judgment about what their expertise is. That is, you could ask doctors and they say, oh, I do it just like house, when in fact they do not. So one of the things that it's, that's really critical here is the expertise. But the other thing that you see is, is that if you if that expertise is, is somehow going to be mostly down here, those are the decisions, but it's all primed by this recognition stuff over which you have little control. That is, you don't say when you look at the chessboard, let me quickly go through my mind and see if this is one of these or those. You just look at it and you recognize it. Just the same way if I say to you, how is it that you can recognize the face of Richard Milhouse Nixon? You would say, well, he's got these features, da, 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 da. But the recognition occurs actually before you pick out those features. And so recognition is something that's very important because it sets up the limited number of possibilities here such that if you get it wrong, you can end up having a decision which, although correct for the problem that you thought you were having, that is what you recognized, is incorrect for the situation you face. And that's exactly what happened. In the one case, the captain of the Stark was facing an actual attack, did not understand that or recognize that as an attack, failed to think about that in that way, failed to defend his ship. And the ship was damaged. And in the case of the Vincennes, the captain is faced with what is not an attack, but sees an attack. He sees what he is, what he recognizes in the data that he is facing is an attack. And he responds, he doesn't make an error in decision uh, so much as he makes an error in recognition. Admittedly, this is a, not a really clear dis distinction. But the, the important thing here is that we have much less control over these sorts of processes than we would over these. And keeping this in mind is one of the reasons why you have to be so careful. If you think about it, this becomes a whole bunch of stuff related to human factors. right? You could understand that the way in which you display a problem, how you show it to people, would have a huge impact on their ability to recognize it as a particular case and therefore get the right decision. And interestingly enough, the Combat Information Center was not designed for use in literal waters where you have both friend and foe floating around each other in all these different tracks. It'll, 
their screens looked like air traffic control screens, not like a screens of a battle, uh, a battle going on. The, the system was not really configured for that. It was configured for World War III Russians versus the Americans. So in a way, this event with the Vincennes and, and the Stark in, in, in reaction to it begin to tell us that human factors really makes a big difference. How you present problems really makes a big difference. It is also true that it is not just an image that matters. It's an understanding of how you get to that image. Because one of the things that is different than the chess world is that the world over here is really rich in information. There's lots of data that you could choose to look at. It's, it's rich and filled with lots of information. And so the question is, which information matters? What should you pay attention to? What should you ignore? It's not like a chessboard where everything about the world is contained in 64 squares. And the consequence of this is that people have developed techniques for getting through this data and understanding what's going on. And this is something that Klein observes when he's in the Aegis cruiser uh, looking at people and that he, that he writes about. That, but it's a little bit obscure because so much of the other stuff is so controversial. But one of the things that he comes up with in this is this idea that uh, you can have a situation, ha have a, a, a kind of a condition that these guys call uh, having the bubble. And this is a slang term. Like all operator communities, the Navy has lots and lots of slang terms that mean different things, and they're very specific to their locale. And they're used in the ways that slang's always used to identify insiders and reject outsiders and stuff. But they talk about this idea in the CIC of having the bubble. What is having the bubble? Nobody really knows. But it's clear that it's a different state than not having. And what this means is being somehow aware, whatever that is, and appreciating the disposition, that is, the location, uh, nature, and probable futures of all of the different dots that are on the radar display. Basically, having the bubble means that you know what's happening in this world and you can relate to all of the different factors that are being presented on there and understand you're in some sense aware or you have appreciation of all the different things out there and where they are and what they're doing and what they're likely to do in the future. That is, you've accounted for all the different tracks on the display. Everything that could be a threat, everything that could be a friendly force, everything that could be a hazard to navigation, that you know about that space and you understand the relationships between all those things. And when you do that, you have got the bubble. And the idea of this is, a, is an interesting one because the, the idea of a bubble is something sort of fra fragile and, and you know, temporary and so forth. Because once you have the bubble, you have to work to maintain it. So you must continue to look at the displays and track the movements of different things, understand what's going on, look at the forces that are changing. You cannot simply have the bubble. You have to work to maintain it. And so you have to keep this. You have to. You have to have the bubble means continuous sort of cognitive work applied to the situation to understand what's going on. And interestingly enough, it's the one there's always at least one officer in the CIC who has the bubble, and that person is identified as the person who's in charge. And that person is supposed to, if they lose the bubble, announce that they have lost the bubble. That is, they, they no longer know what all these things are. And they're supposed to get a lot of help then in putting that situation back together. Now, they clearly do not have the bubble all the time. And they clearly do not always announce when they don't have the bubble. But sometimes it doesn't matter, and sometimes it does. 
interestingly enough, this is not only true of military situations with their air radar, but it's also true of air traffic control. The classic model here is air traffic control, where they're looking at all the planes traveling through their airspace, trying to keep track of when they're going to intersect, what's going to happen. And these guys also had, will describe a situation where they know what's going on, although they don't use the term having the bubble. They've got an analogous situation, which is understanding what's going on. And we have kind of together lumped this whole thing into a term that we call situation awareness. And this, would, this term gets a lot of use by Woods and Sarter and a bunch of other people, Micah Ensley and some other folks. But the point is that, that what they're talking about is what you get as a result of doing all this work recognizing things and understanding what their implications are, that gives you a situation awareness. And the thing that's important about situation awareness is that you can lose it. You can, you can get misconnected or di uh, distanced from the situation in ways that you forget what's actually the relationships. And that happens. It happens there. It happens here. And it happens to us in our everyday life. It just doesn't matter very much for us because we don't have any devices at our command that can shoot down aircraft. So the fact that you don't have situation awareness at 9.30 at night doesn't mean very much because you're sitting in front of your television eating popcorn. The lack of situation awareness is not a threat to anyone. But it is a threat if you lose, for instance, if you're driving in crowded traffic and you lose sight of what the traffic is, or if you're managing multiple patients in an ICU and you lose sight of which patient has got the changing going on, or if you're in the operation operating room and you're working in some complex operation and you lose sight of what is the relationships are between the different structures that you're manipulating and so on. So this, this has become quite a big part of understanding what it is that people are doing. People will talk about situation awareness. And let me tell you that they say people talk a lot about situation awareness. They do very little meaningful research on it. Everybody writes about it, talks about it, explains it, trains it, does all the rest of that stuff. In terms of understanding it, there's almost nothing out there. It's really it's quite remarkable that there's so little. But the point is that everybody realizes that this is really critical to understanding that this situation and this situation are two completely different situations, and they require different kinds of responses. Okay. And to do this, somehow you have to do all this stuff, which means that you have to go back through all of this process and get that right. This naturalistic decision-making stuff, NDM, has become almost an industry because it has grown like crazy. And the reason it's grown like crazy is because the people who are doing this stuff have got no way to make it work. That is, doing Bayesian calculation sounds great afterwards when you've got all the information you could sit there and calculate what people should have done. It doesn't help people at all when they're trying to deal with things. In fact, this NDM thing is all about real world situations, real settings. It's fire commanders, it's forest firefighters, it's uh, battlefield activities, it's police and riots, it's a whole bunch of stuff like that. Those are all situations where you're going to be faced with time pressure, imperfect information, evolving situations, and you're going to need to act. And what people want to do is help folks deal with these situations. It's wonderful to imagine. It would, it would be great to say, well, I'm going to assume that we know all, everything that there is to know. We can spend as long as we want calculating it. That's fine. You go be an economist. Okay, that's what they do. They just assume. You can't assume any of these things. If you're one of the people who's working here in the CIC, you, this is a very real problem. It has very real consequences. And so the study of NDM has become a kind of an industry with people looking at lots and lots of situations and essentially finding very much the same story over and over and trying to figure out ways to help people develop either more expertise at doing these things or building other kinds of ways to help aid their processes of recognition. Now, this brings up just one little last point before we close. This brings up a kind of an interesting problem, which is that you're used to thinking about human information processing and decision making as a, as a very fragile and easy to, to um, uh, 
easy to mislead process. We tend to think of people who are thinking about things as making lots of errors, making lots of stuff. And, and the way that people will do this for you is they will show you uh, various kinds of, of visual illusions. You know, they will show you something like this. Um, let's see, they'll show you a drawing that looks like this. And then they will say, uh, can, do these, is, are the lines parallel? Are they di uh, diverging? Are they parallel or diverging? Or something like that. And th there are a bunch of optical kinds of illusions that you can create where people will routinely give you the wrong answer, which people take as evidence that this recognition process is flawed in some way, that it doesn't work very well. Look how easily I can fool you. Okay, I can trick you with, by drawing something and then asking you an analytical question about it, and you will get the answer wrong. Gosh, your recognition process isn't very robust. You're not a very good recognizer, and therefore you must not be a very good decision maker. You'll make the wrong decisions. Or they will talk about um, what we call heuristics and biases. These are rules of thumb that we use to figure out how to deal with the fact that we don't have enough information to actually decide, or getting that information is going to be hard. And they'll say, oh, look, heuristics are rules that don't work all the time. That's a rule of thumb, and rule of thumbs don't work in every case, which is absolutely true. However, rules of thumb work in most of the cases that we encounter. That's why we have rules of thumb. We don't build our rules of thumb by having the experience over and over that it never works. If you, if you have a rule of thumb that never works, you don't, it's not a rule of thumb. So it turns out that heuristics actually are very valuable things because they allow us to do calculations, what is, it amounts to a whole bunch of calculation work, very, very quickly by using a rule of thumb, by doing this, this business about you know, selecting from a limited number of alternatives. And biases are probably very much the same way. People say, well, you've got a confirmation bias, you've got a hindsight bias. You've got a, uh, admittedly, you can demonstrate those things in the psychology laboratory. But it's a lot harder to show that these things are sources of lots of bad decisions in the real world. And the reason is because most of the decisions in the real world are done well. Most of the time, you don't do this and this. There's lots of other cases where you're doing the right thing. We tend to take our laboratory demonstrations of the ways in which human cognition can be flawed and assume that it means that human cognition is deficient. Look, I can de develop all these optical illusions and you'll get it wrong every time. And I can test it on hundreds of different people and they'll get it wrong every time. A, a good example is something called the water glass experiment. Do you know the water glass experiment? In the water glass experiment, I draw uh, a glass like this. And I make a point here, and I say, this is the water level in the glass. And I ask you to draw a line which shows the water in the glass. I say, it's touching this point, draw me the line. And people almost always draw a line that goes like this. Now, the true static picture would be like this. But people draw a line that's inclined in some way. Okay. So somebody did an experiment once. It, it's, this is a robust finding. You'll find this over and over and over when you test it. Somebody said, well, you know, this expertise thing should play a role. We were really testing people about abstract ideas, but what if we tested people who are supposed to know something about water and glasses? So they did an experiment where they separated out two groups of people. One group of people was taxi drivers, and the other people was um, bar waiters and waitresses. Okay? The taxi drivers are the control group. They're, there's nothing particular that they do have, I mean, no expertise at handling water and glasses, right? But bartenders, bar, bar waitresses, but these are people who have to carry drinks around. They should get this right. I mean, right? They, if you're saying, look, lots of experience makes you good at particular tasks, the problem with this doing this thing was, well, they don't have the experience, and therefore they get it wrong, they're naive. But if you take these people, these are, these are supposedly experts. These are experts. These are experts. They should get like this. They should do this, whereas our, our taxi drivers should do the other way. Right? And they do the test, and what do you see? Well, of course. They both do this. And so 
This experiment, when it was done, is becomes the famous test of the water glass experiment and a test of expertise in the water glass experiment. And the, the argument that they make is, look, these guys are experts. These are not. They both get tripped up the same way by the optical illusion or the, the construction of the stance. Therefore, expertise is not the key. They publish this paper. So one of the people who writes in a letter about this paper is a physicist, not a psychologist. And the physicist writes in and he says, you know, he says, if you think about it, this is a very unusual position for a glass to be in. This is not the way in which we normally would have a glass. We would normally have a glass like this. And if you draw the glass this way, people draw the line this way. They do. But in this way, you draw the glass, people do this, this thing here. He said, you know, it's, if you watch what waiters and waitresses do, you'll realize that they actually do a fairly sophisticated amount of physics. What they do is they take a, a platter holding a bunch of drinks with fluid levels in them, and then they move that to some other place, which means that this, the fluids all undergo an acceleration. You stop and then you start, that's an acceleration. And when you accelerate something, it resists and wants to move back. So when you accelerate, what will happen is that the levels in these glasses will go like this. Okay? And so if you watch waiters and waitresses, as they begin to move, they will tilt the platter slightly like this to raise the angle so that the fluid in the glasses stays level. And when they get to the other end and stop, they will do the reverse. They will tilt it the other way. What this shows, I think, is that Although you can develop these little kinds of laboratory experiments to show that human cognition is not very good, when you actually look at human performance in the real world, it's excellent, especially in experts. And the problem that we have is not that experts are easily fooled. It's that our experiments that we do in the laboratory don't actually look at what the constitution of real expertise is. It's not a fault of the experts that they can't solve this problem. No one can solve this problem. No one has this problem. Therefore, it's not a real problem. And nobody deals with non-real problems. It's hard to have expertise at not real problems. But if you watch people who do this, they actually manage the task extremely well, even though they may not be able to tell you very much about it. And most of the things that we set up that are examples of optical illusions or little tricks that demonstrate that people have biases or or are, are subject to problems with heuristics are just that. They're little tricks. They are examples derived for laboratory purposes that say almost nothing about the real world. And indeed, this is the problem that has made NDM so valuable. The fact that it's talking about the real world as it is, taking real world situations and studying them there, and accepting that what's going on is not just another version of some funny laboratory task but something else that needs to be explored and understood in its own environment, in its own setting, in situ rather than in sort of ex vivo kind of setting. And that's why NDM has become, the, along with RPD, have become the sort of predominant understanding that we use when we are doing research in the world. We don't ask people how they do calculations because we don't believe that they do them. We don't ask people to tell us much about their recognition because they can't tell us about recognition very well. We offer them examples of problems and we ask them to do recognition on those. Or we look for features that make recognition possible. And we, under, we look at ways in which they are able to keep their situation awareness tuned up so that they know what's going on in the world. Things that can make it hard to sustain situation awareness are things that are likely to cause problems in the real world as well. But the thing that comes from studying things in this naturalistic decision way is, is a much greater appreciation for how complex and subtle expertise in the real world really is. 
The captains of these two ships were in situations which were almost impossible to get right. They'd been put at such a disadvantage by the planning of these weapon systems for use in a different setting, by this combination of trying to sort out friend and foe and all the rest of the things, that, that it was really quite a difficult task. And we should not be surprised if sometimes it goes wrong. But what we actually get from this when we study it is how sophisticated these activities are and how much people are aware of the need to be able to understand what's going on. They actually work to create this. And people who work in the ICU, people who work in the emergency room, people who work in flight decks and other places, when they come on shift, take some time to get up to speed knowing what's going on. When they take over a case in the operating room, they don't start out having the bubble, but they eventually get it. We're all, all practitioners understand this as part of their world, but they don't have a good vocabulary for it. And that's what uh, uh, Klein and, and the others have really drawn us to. We now can talk about what's actually going on that way. Questions?